Well, I promised both of you I wouldn't swear when it came to the marketplace of insurance, <laughs> but I, I, I would simply say it is precarious and it is difficult to say the least. And the question I get often from board members is, Jonathan, I don't understand why my earthquake policy is going up 10, 15%. Our exposure hasn't changed. Our values haven't changed. Oh, and by the way, we haven't had an earthquake in 20 plus years that created significant damage. What is going on? Most people are not equipped to understand the seemingly endless facets of an HOA. That's why we're here, to help you become uncommonly prepared to serve your HOA. Whether you're a board member or a manager, join us in the Uncommon Area. Welcome to the Uncommon Area. I am Matthew Holbrook, and this episode is all about earthquake insurance. And joining me to discuss this topic is Matt Davidson, Actions Executive Vice President, and Jonathan Naranjo, uh, Senior Vice President at New Front Insurance. So appreciate both of you being a part of this discussion. And um, Matt, I'm going to go ahead and let you take the lead on uh, on where we want to go with talking about earthquake insurance. All right, thanks. I think, Jonathan... From a foundational standpoint, like, let's just try to address the question of why an HOA should think mm -hmm. about buying earthquake insurance and who buys it. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Thank you for having me here. Earthquake insurance fundamentally here in California is an important consideration for obvious reasons. You know, we're here in California, San Francisco, Los Angeles. Those areas tend to be highly prone to earth movement or an earthquake event. But when you look at the communities that purchase earthquake coverage, whether it's a mid-rise, a high-rise, even a planned unit development, there are key considerations that many of our board members go through. Number one, the obvious one is price. Can we afford it? Can we budget for it? But number two, it's a way for owners living at this commu these communities to reduce their exposure in terms of a loss assessment and damage that they would be responsible for. As you know, Matthew, earthquake is commonly excluded on most of the property and all risk policies. Therefore, uh, to consider it, you have to get a standalone, what we call a difference in conditions policy uh, to eliminate that gap or exposure. The coverage act's fundamentally um, pretty simple. It's coverage for damage to foundations. It's coverage for any damage that impacted the building structurally, uh, which includes the common areas. Um, though the ones that are structured really well often include enhancements that extend earthquake coverage to certain betterments and improvements that were done and invested by the owners. And so as our board members are considering earthquake coverage, um, you know, one of the key items is, hey, what is the probability that a next event is going to create significant damage? Number two, um, the architectural integrity of the building. You know, is it newly developed? Is it an older building? There's a different risk exposure between a reinforced steel concrete building versus a wood frame or joisted masonry, for example. Yeah. So before we get too far mm -hmm. into that, um, let's maybe take like one step back and just address a couple of questions that at least I've heard very frequently mm -hmm. over the years. And those are number one, like, shouldn't our community already have a budget for earthquake insurance? And the answer is that the Department of Real Estate does not require mm -hmm. that that be included in an initial budget. So legally, an association doesn't have to buy it. But as you were saying earlier, if you have knowledge that you live in an area where earthquake presents a real mm -hmm. risk, then it may be something that the board and the owners should consider, you know, as an opportunity to manage that risk. Um, and then I think we should also talk a little bit, you know, before we get into too much about different types of products mm -hmm. uh, or architectural products, I guess, like how does earthquake insurance fundamentally work? You, you mentioned that it's a difference in conditions policy. Mm -hmm. And I think that like the deductible structure, for instance, doesn't work the same way as right. like a regular property policy that might cover fire. Yeah, and you bring up some great points. The deductible is often um, confusing at times, especially those that are layman's to insurance and they're, you're not insurance experts. And so oftentimes when you buy a loss limit, right, it's a limit 
that is lower than the actual cost to replace the building or the community, you buy that loss limit for a number of reasons. You go off of a probable maximum loss study, which we'll talk about best practices around that and why it's important to evaluate. But you also uh, buy the loss limit because of just capacity in today's environment with regards to earthquake capacity and its deployment and how expensive it is. The deductible, to your point, Matthew, is a calculation of a percentage of the overall insurable values to replace. So let's put that into perspective. If you are looking at a master earthquake policy and you're, you're a board of directors trying to understand how the deductible is calculated and your building is $100 million to replace, for example, and we're offering either a 5%, which is a common best practice, or a 10% of that replacement cost, the association's deductible can range between $5 million and $10 million. Once that deductible is satisfied, then you can draw down on the loss limit not to exceed what was procured and purchased at that time. But, so, yeah, go but ahead. if you have a $100 million building and you buy $30 million in earthquake coverage, your deductible, whether it's 5 or 10%, is not based upon the $30 million policy you bought. It's, it's based uh, upon the $100 million value of your building. 100%. So if you have $30 million in coverage and a 10% deductible, you have to come up with $10 million first before you get to access the 30 million that you bought. That's correct. Right? That's correct. And oftentimes it's, you know, how do we find that, um, c that area that makes sense, that sweet spot, I should call it. The key of a probable maximum loss survey, and if it's okay, I'll go right into that. Yeah, go, go for it. The key, of a P, the key item to a PML is to help boards and communities make an educated business decision. Obviously, you don't want to over-insure, right? Because those premium dollars can get expensive and capacity can be tight. But you also don't want to under-insure. So how do you go about doing that? Well, the PML is something that any broker can work with their wholesale partner and provide on behalf of the community. And if any of the, your boards or communities are considering a master earthquake policy, a number one best practice to ask them is, did you ask your broker to provide a PML? And why that's important, again, not underinsuring or overinsuring, but the board of directors now can document their due diligence behind the spend, but ultimately why they came up with a loss limit that they did. So that in the event of a loss, if that loss limit is eroded and the damage exceeds that, and there's questions coming back to the community that simply says, hey, how did you go about procuring this? You now have documentation backed by sophisticated modeling to help you justify and showcase that decision made. So when you are considering uh, associations that choose to not purchase any earthquake insurance. Mm -hmm. um, it seems that the the driving factor for that would just be what you were just talking about, Matt, with where those deductibles can range. And so it's the it's the concern around the uh, the deductible. Mm -hmm. Are there well maybe before I get to that, what would you guess is the the percentage of associations that actually do purchase earthquake insurance. Yeah, and, and it really depends. But if I were to aggregate the portfolio, I would say, and we classify them between plan unit developments, garden style, mid and high rise communities, I would say overall bucket, if I put those groups in a bucket, about 25%. Okay. Which mm -hmm. means 75% of the communities we tend to work with are not procuring that for a variety of different reasons. There could be a split community, as you know, right? There are 45% in favor, but the majority is not. Yeah. Not everybody agrees uh, with regards to the risk tolerance of a community. So if you're a newer developed building and the architectural integrity is sound and it's been seismically retrofitted already, we've heard owners say, well, why do we need it? We don't see the risk there. But to, the point is about 75% go uninsured because they're looking at the risk reward, they're looking at the building characteristics, and the risk tolerance of every owner is not uh, consistent. Everybody has a different right. risk tolerance and what they're willing to pay for in terms of increased dues if you were to mandate it, because to your point earlier, it's not required by the DRE, it's not the law, and almost all the governing documents that we've reviewed do not have a provision to mandate the community of ha for having it. So uh, among those different buckets or different categories mm -hmm. of association types, 
does that percentage of 25% does it skew a lot higher in, in any one of those those buckets? Yes, I would say the majority of that 25% is skewed to the mid and the high rise, uh, right. the high rise communities. So what do um, associations do and or individual homeowners when they don't have earthquake insurance? Is there anything else that they can do to mitigate that risk? They can. So homeowners have the opportunity to go out to the open market and procure uh, a standalone earthquake policy. You may have heard of the CEA, the California Earthquake Authority. Those are government back options that allow you to have some coverage. Um, but ultimately, when you're looking at the marketplace, condominium insurance is known as a HO6 policy. We've talked about that before. Earthquake obviously is excluded. And the options available in the marketplace right now are limited for homeowners. Uh, California Earthquake Authority is a great example. You can buy coverage, but it's capped at $100,000 in loss assessment. And there's a tieback provision to that, which means for the California Earthquake Authority policy to be active, there has to be a HO6 policy it can tie it back to. We've seen situations where an owner doesn't have an HO6, they purchased the CEA and then it created complications. And the other, just one sort of foundational thing to note too, is that the what you really want if you're a condominium owner is the loss assessment yes. coverage because as an individual condominium owner, you can't insure the building, the association has to do that. And mm -hmm. if the association didn't or doesn't have enough coverage for some reason, mm -hmm. it's the loss assessment that is going to be the charge to all the owners to repair the damage. Absolutely. And that's that's the number one value in our opinion, right, is how do we protect their financial out-of-pocket exposure in the event that a significant loss assessment were to occur because they don't have a master earthquake policy. We also have to take into consideration, going back to the deductible, even if a community purchases um, a master policy, they're still going to be responsible for their share of that deductible once it's allocated. So if that's $5 million or $10 million, and as you astutely mentioned, it doesn't matter what the loss limit is, the deductible doesn't change, hey, we have a $10 million deductible, that's still going to have to be allocated amongst the owners uh, in terms of an assessment. And that's where the loss assessment policy could help with for an individual. Absolutely. Homeowner. Now, did I understand you correctly? You said that that's, we're looking at probably a limit of $100,000 on that type of a policy, or did I misunderstand that? No, you got it correctly. It's uh, this California Earthquake Authority is limited to 100000 There are other providers that are providing standalone condominium earthquake coverage around loss assessment, but those limits are lower. We do work with a partner. Many of your communities have enrolled in, um, and they work with different brokers, a company called Modus Insurance. They're an MGA, a managing general agent, and they have three commercial earthquake insurers that back their program, uh, like ICW, for example, which is admitted um, and it's uh, well-ranked. And they're able to get commercial rates <clears throat> for individual owners living in these communities to provide loss assessment to their true exposure. So they can go up to a million plus on loss assessment coverage. They can even include things like content. Where the CEA is limited is coverage doesn't extend to areas like swimming pools and fences and underground pipes, drains and flues. Doesn't extend to jacuzzis, for example. The modus option does, however. So it's broader in coverage it's priced cost effectively compared to the other options. And it's something that we're seeing the uh, industry, especially around HOAs, uh, gravitate towards. Is that something that, that someone would purchase in addition to the coverage through the CEA or in place of? It would be in place of. It, okay. it would be a substitute. I like to say that the modus option is the CEA on steroids, for example. Okay. It's broader in coverage. You can protect yourself at a higher loss limit. Um, and they're able to get competitive rates because it's backed by three commercial earthquake insurers. So for a homeowner living in a high rise mm -hmm. that the, the majority of the homeowners or the board determines they are not going to get earthquake insurance, but yet the homeowner doesn't have that risk appetite and they say, I want to, to mitigate um, that risk, then they need to very specifically be looking for the, at those options for loss assessment coverage. Absolutely. Yeah, especially if earthquake is something that they just want sleep at night coverage, their risk appetite uh, tends to be more conservative. Absolutely. And there are various options out there. 
Um, I would advise for the owners living in these communities to uh, work with your agent, work with your broker partner, ask the questions to understand, hey, in the event of an earthquake, does it cover me for things like loss of use? And how does that coverage kick in? You know, what are the deductibles? What is my responsibility? And so it's good, just good due diligence to ask those type of questions as they're reviewing uh, the options. Is the cost for um, going back to if an HOA was to purchase mm -hmm. earthquake coverage, is the cost for that coverage primarily driven by the overall value of the building? Um, or you had alluded to earlier that there are different kinds of buildings, different kinds of structures. Does that risk factor actually mm -hmm. go into the what the ultimate premium is? And is there anything that an association could do before procuring that kind of coverage that might even improve what their overall premium might be? Yeah, so the short answer is all of those factors you just described go into the modeling and the consideration of pricing for a master earthquake policy. Um, fundamentally, it's rate times exposure equals your premium. And to your earlier point, Matthew, exposure being the total cost to replace the building at 100% its replacement costs. So they get a rate, they multiply it by, let's say, 100 million, out comes your premium. But the critical factors that are reviewed during underwriting are very similar to a regular property or general liability policy. They need to understand the characteristics of the building, right? We call it COPE. It's a C-O-P-E, an acronym for the construction, occupancy, protection class and type, and the exposure. So if you are newly developed, you are fire resistive, reinforced concrete and steel, um, you are adhering to the newest and latest codes in the municipality codes, especially around seismic upgrades. Those tend to um, come out more favorably in terms of the risk tolerance. On the contrary, if you have a, um, a community that is wood frame, it hasn't been seismically retrofitted, it's in a fault line, let's say in Hayward, for example, has tuck under parking, which also has life safety issues to it, that would be prone to a higher rate to a higher premium. So Jonathan, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, you know, how you actually put together earthquake coverage. Um, like let's say that the, an association decides we want to move forward and purchase some level of earthquake mm -hmm. insurance for the building. We got a, a probable maximum loss study done mm -hmm. and we think we need $50 million. They're not going to be able to just get one carrier to write them a $50 million policy, mm -hmm. right? So how does that all come together and how are the different pieces, um, how do they compare from a premium standpoint? Sure. It's a great question. And we'll talk about some of the market conditions impacting this. But you're right. There are a limited group of commercial earthquake insurers that can deploy 50 million or 100 million dollars of capacity. And we have a term in our business that is, well, we go do a quota share or shared and layered structure, meaning we're getting multiple insurance companies to participate to get to a loss limit that is commensurate with a PML study. And that makes sense given that sweet spot we talked about earlier. So if we look at a PML, there are going to be what we call return periods outlining what the worst case locked loss expectancy would be given an 8.0 magnitude earthquake. That time period that we look at to come up with and develop this policy is between 250 and a 500 year event. 500 years, the, the, the longer you go out, the likelihood of higher loss, but the probability goes down. And so if over 250 and a 500 year return period, it, the modeling is projecting a $25 million loss once your deductible is satisfied, net of deductible, then we can start building a 25 or $30 million loss limit um, given what the market can bear. And so to get to 30 million, you're right, there's not a lot of carriers out there that can put up that capacity all with one swoop. So we go to, you know, we find the first 10 million, that's created. We get another insure, insurer to do 15X of that 10 million, for example, and then we can layer it um, while maintaining some type of cost containment and what makes sense. So that's step one when you're looking at the PMO. And if, if you're an association that already has earthquake insurance, say you've been buying it for years and, you know, the, the pressures of inflation are sort of impacting yeah. your budget, then what kinds of options do you have to say, you know, 
still protect your risk to some extent. You want to buy insurance, but where could you flex? It's a good, it's a good question. I think how conservative do you want to be as a community, right? The, when we're looking at the PML, we start at 250 year return period. So the loss is not going to be as great compared to a 500 year. Maybe instead of going ultra conservative at that 500 period, you find kind of that sweet spot in the middle. So almost taking the average of a PML, so to speak. Um, you can also flex on deductible, right? If you want to go from a 5% to a 10%, you can do that and there will be savings. In our experience as insurance brokers, however, in order to double your out-of-pocket exposure from going from five to 10, often results in a nominal reduction in premium. I'll give you an example. Okay. Let's say you have a $100 million building because the math is easy. And to go from a $5 million to a $10 million deductible, that can save you, let's say, fifteen dollars to $20,000 in annual premium. There are meaningful savings there, but you've now just increased your exposure by another $5 million. So one of the best practices that we walk our clients through and our board members as we're providing these advisory services is, hey, look, given the math and what you're saving, does it make sense to increase the deductible by five, 10, sometimes $20 million, depending on the exposure? And oftentimes it doesn't, but those are areas that you can flex. You can always reduce coverage as a way to reduce price. That's not, um, that's not something that we would recommend, but there are certain enhancements like, hey, do you want ensuing water to be excluded? Well, due to burst pipes, that can save you another five grand to 10 grand sometimes. So there are ways that you can flex. Um, eliminating coverage is not our preferred way. I think I would argue in the event of an 8.0 magnitude earthquake, having uh, ensuing water because of burst pipes is a critical coverage. Um, but there are areas around deductibles, loss limits that you can certainly take a look at and evaluate to try to keep those premium figures somewhat contained. Okay. I want to be mindful of not saying reduce because we're not seeing any reductions right now, but how do we contain it? Yeah. Um, and maybe if you can get a property policy that covers earthquake sprinkler leakage or something, then you could perhaps eliminate like one of those extra coverages on the difference in conditions policy? Absolutely. And you'd be surprised how many times we see duplicate coverage just because of complacency on the form. And so I would suggest to all board members working with your broker partner, make sure you are not paying for earthquake sprinkler and leakage on your master earthquake policy, because as you'd mentioned, it's commonly added on your regular property policy. So we do see duplications there sometimes. Another uh, call out and best practice is a lot of these property policies as a value add will include flood coverage. You wanna make sure you're not paying for flood as a bolt on to the earthquake policy. We've seen that sometimes. And That's the question is asked is, well, why are you, you have flood already built into your property. Why are you purchasing it on your earthquake? So that could be a consideration to reduce it. And I want to say one last thing, and I know this may seem unorthodox, but this is what we are told by the underwriting community and their leaders. Having a building submitted from your broker partner to an underwriter and a carrier partner, um, assessing whether or not they want to write your risk around earthquake, having a building that is adequately valued, and we can talk about the adequacy of value all day long, but one that is not grossly underinsured, Right. So if you have a high rise in, you know, Los Angeles and it's submitted at one hundred and twenty five a foot, well, that's going to create a lot of red uh, red flags. And when you say one hundred and twenty five a foot, you're talking about the calculation of the replacement costs that the property policy is based on. Right. Exactly. And what is sort of common industry standard? We'll just stick with your analogy of a high rise yeah. in Los Angeles now for replacement costs. So I would say minimum what we're seeing for a high rise in Los Angeles, places like San Francisco, minimum is 400 a foot to rebuild. Okay. okay. Now that has increased drastically over the last five years as many of the communities had to go through the challenge and rigor of increasing values to an adequate level. But ultimately there is premium impact to go along with that. But the point I was making to the question you asked was, what are other ways that you can contain costs a little bit? Well, if you are adequately valued as deemed by the underwriter and your broker submits a valuation of 400 a foot, for example, or 300 a foot, and it's not grossly underinsured, you actually get favorable 
rating and pricing because now they don't have to question the validity and accuracy of that. They put it in their models and it checks out well, and they're actually going to give you a preferred rate because of how well it's valued. Oh, that's good to know. Okay. So maybe the last thing to cover on this topic is uh, what's happening with the marketplace in general. I think that that's a common question that board members and homeowners have. Like at Renewal, are we expecting any increase, a big increase, and why? Well, I promised both of you I wouldn't swear when it came to the marketplace of insurance, <laughs> but I, I, I would simply say it is precarious and it is difficult, to say the least. And the question I get often from board members is, Jonathan, I don't understand why my earthquake policy is going up 10 15%. Our exposure hasn't changed. Our values haven't changed. Oh, and by the way, we haven't had an earthquake in 20 plus years that created significant damage. What is going on? Savvy board members. It's a great question. And one of the things I have to do and my team and I do is remind our communities that insurance carriers that are specializing in what we call cat or catastrophic risk are not only insuring earthquake in California, they're paying out and hemorrhaging billions of dollars for hurricanes like Ian that happened last year, for you know 15 multi-billion dollar events that occurred in 2022 alone because of uh, weather related and climate change. So hurricanes and floods, wind, windstorm in Florida, for example, are creating multi-billion dollar ins uh, insur insurance losses, creating a hardening effect. And that's ultimately going to impact earthquake because many of these insurers are looking to diversify, which they are, but they're looking to take rates somewhere that is profitable to help offset some of the hemorrhaging that is going out, going on in the East Coast and Midwest. So it's not, it's not easy right now. And the last component is capacity is dwindling. So to try to get 50, 60, 70 million dollars of earthquake limit is becoming problematic and more difficult because a lot of these insurers are beholden to their reinsurance treaties which is their backstop when it comes to uh, protecting their balance sheet. So but reinsurance a, is basically just an insurance policy that the insurance company buys, right? Exactly. And so the average reinsurance cost, most of the treaties renewed on 1-1, one, one, the average reinsurance increase for these insurers was 40%. So eventually that's going to trickle down and pass on to their end user. And those are the communities and the ones that are procuring and purchasing the policy. So it's difficult. So right now, if you are going through a renewal, um, we advise get out in front of it with your broker partner 120 to 90 days in advance, minimum. Have your When broker do you think you're gonna get the numbers back though? Let's Great say you question. start 120 yes. days out. Are you gonna get your quotes back 90 days out? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I know, I wish that that is the common theme is we want our quotes earlier. And there's a few reasons. The number one reason is underwriters, like most industries, are facing a huge deficit with talent and in, in intellectual capital coming into the industry. It's hard to find good people. It's even harder to find good people who want to come into insurance. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, most people don't just go to college and say, can't wait to be an insurance professional, right? And so when underwriters are looking at their volume, meaning all the submissions that brokers are sending them, they're prioritizing based off of renewals that are 30 days in advance because they are encouraged to retain business, to retain good profitable business on the books. And even though we submit and they acknowledge, they're still tackling what's in front of them in terms of a priority and timing. However, getting out in front of it 90 to 120 days in advance assures the community and the board and the broker partner uh, being able to scour the marketplace so that you can get the best deal, you can get the best enhancements. And I would say 30 days is reasonable. Giving the board of directors 30 days to present and to make a decision, that's kind of what we're seeing on average. But at least during the 90 days uh, window, you can evaluate the PML, you can go over it with your board part and your board of directors, and you can work with your broker to come up with a loss limit and deductible structure that makes sense. And I would often encourage every board and every community and every general manager to ask your broker partner, can I see the due diligence and marketing report that was conducted on behalf of the community to help understand why this recommendation is being, uh, is being solicited and is being recommended? Yeah. 
Well, Jonathan, that was super helpful. Um, really appreciate you being part of this episode. And thank you, Matt, for uh, helping to, uh, to direct those questions. Uh, I hope that this was a helpful episode for you here on The Uncommon Area, and I would encourage you to look for additional episodes where we cover a whole variety of other topics. 